Yo. What it do? What's up, brother? You got it? What's up with you? I'm good. My connection good over here? Hold on a second. Can you hear me? Yeah, how's the connection over here? How's my, how's my connection? You sound good. All right, cool, cool. We Morris, are, how you doing, brother? I'm good, man. We are good to go. Everything is good. Everything is moving real wavy today. So how, how, how's it going on your end? Everything's great. You know, I'm feeling good. I mean, and let me first uh, thank you for coming on the show. I know you had a busy day today. Are you um, you performing at this other concert? It happened already. Oh, it happened. Yeah, yeah. Now yeah. tell the people about it because a lot of people don't don't know that uh, once we get off, y'all can even jump jump over. And what's, yeah, what's so, the concert? You know, I think I think it was based on based on my original um, idea of. You know, bringing hip hop artists together with right. um, for cats that aren't from New York. What my man Ralph McDaniel's did. Uh, Ralph McDaniel's used to have this this real popular video show called Video Music Box, and that was the way everybody in New York saw any hip hop video because nobody else right. was really playing it like that. So, music Video Music Box was rocking, and I think. Um, he got together with Mass Appeal, and then there's a big hip hop museum opening up in New York, and they all got together and they decided to pretty much take my template and use that as a benefit to um, help out the essential workers of New York City. So, with donations, we were able to um, pull in some money and to get masks, to get um, scrubs, to get ventilators, and just just overall help for the New York City essential worker, especially the ones that are on the front line fighting COVID. So a gang, 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 gang of New York-based rappers and, and some other rappers too. Um, Ice-T was on it. Um, Dave East is on it. So there's a few different different other um, rappers coming through um, got together and they donated their time and just rocked a song or two and, and helped with this benefit. Or so I mean, it's dope. And 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 for a lot of people that don't know, when you say they kind of expanded off your idea, yeah. Um, a lot of people don't know that you do the classic hip hop one. There was the one song breakfast. Yeah, jam, the one right? song breakfast jam. So every Saturday, every, basically, um, this whole coronavirus thing has has um, transformed a lot of us into doing other things and um but before i want to get into that like another a new york based rapper um, you know definitely one of a very dope lyricist fred the godson succumbed to the effects of coronavirus today no way yeah and um you know he was fighting it for the last two weeks two and a half weeks you know he was posting from his hospital bed saying that things were getting better things were getting better but you know he got called home basically this afternoon or this morning from it. And wow. and so, you know, a lot of us dedicated our sets to him as well. Um, so I definitely wanted to give, uh, give a shout out to, to him, acknowledge him and his family, um, you know, based on this. But what I was saying about my, um, my breakfast jam, you know, just out of nowhere, you know, I saw a lot of DJs, doing their thing on Instagram, you know, they were doing their thing before, but they were just ramping it up. You know what I'm saying? Really getting down with, with that whole Instagram um, DJ thing and just trying to uplift everybody. So my thing was, look, I'm not really a DJ. I can play some records, but what I know how to do is bring, um, bring artists <coughs> together and let me right. try to do that just to, bring artists together from all coasts. It's not just an East Coast thing, a West Coast thing, um, a Southern thing. I was trying to, I wanted to bring everybody together just to show people that we are doing the same thing you're doing. We're home, you're home. We're going through through this lockdown too. So that's what I did. We did the first Breakfast Jam. You, you graced us. We had 20 artists that graced us. Then we did the second, um, and we went six hours straight, man. I thought I was... You know, I thought I was only going to do it for an hour. We ended up rocking six hours straight. You definitely helped me out 
of bringing these dope West Coast artists like Razcast and Todd and, 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 and King T. And it was just so dope um, the way that came together. Uh, we had JJ Fad. It was, it was, it was everything I always wanted to see a tour look like. Not right. separated, not just East Coast, not just West Coast. Like the tours that we were on, you know what I'm saying? We were on tours that was so eclectic. Um, the original tours we were on, um, and I wanted to have that represented. So we did the first one uh, on March 28th, and then the last one we did last weekend, and. We had Big Daddy Kane, Biz Markie, Raz Kaz came on, Grandmaster Kaz came through, Dougie Fresh came through, and then we had some giveaways. We gave away some of your um, your product, the 90s tees. Um, it was dope, man. And so I think, you know, based on that template that nobody was doing before, the, the, the Universal Hip Hop Museum was able to say, okay, this thing can work, and then they they took it to another level by doing that benefit. Yeah, and, and, and I do appreciate the fact that you did include, you know, the whole hip hop universe. Yeah, and man. You, got, um, you had a uh, Philly Freeway on there too. Yeah, we have Freeway. I forgot. Yep, yeah, you, you're right. We have Freeway on there. We have Wise Intelligence from Poor Righteous Teachers. Right. Yeah. You know, it was dope. It was just an. It was just a very, and even the next one that I, I think that I'm going to do. Uh, the next one is. I think May 2nd. I'm doing it for um, this um, a mental health organization called Silence the Shame. So we're going to be doing things uh, for mental health awareness and, and bringing artists together for that. So, you know, I think the hardest part about it is reaching out to the artists and, and you know, getting them to do it. And it wasn't, it wasn't hard. You know what I'm saying? People were generally, generally down. And you know, those are the people that I like to align myself with, you know, because um, we know how artists can be. Some artists can be funny. Some artists can be real cool. Some artists can just be ghost on you. So, you know, it's cool that when you reach out that these these dope artists are able to say, yeah, I'm down and, and come through. And the one thing that I also like about it, and for anybody that, that hasn't seen it, you just in this aspect, you have to check it out, is that, you know, I was, I was kind of entertained by watching each way that the artists presented themselves. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like Chuck Rock, he's out in the backyard by the lake, flossing. Um, King T had the video behind him. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And the different ways, you know, Moni, she just held, held the phone. Yeah. You know, it, it went from a, some people did a big production, some people just got on and just did it. Yeah. Um, even Tash is like, yo, my girl is my DJ and whatnot. So I just think it was, um, real entertaining, but kind of segueing into something else. Um, your thoughts, and, and then I just want to finish the statement before you answer, on the whole babyface Teddy Riley thing, and even with the with the RZA and Premier battle, um, you know, you, right after you see all these memes and people comment about, you know, how the sound sucked and this, that, and the other, and I, and I keep saying that we can't really put it on the artist because I don't think that the technology has caught up with what we're trying to do. Yeah. And, you know, what are your thoughts on that? And, and how soon do you think that it'll come together enough to where it's great content and it sounds great as well? I think, well, I think there's, there's two parts to that. One, someone on the level of Babyface and Teddy Riley did not I repeat, did not, or RZA, or Swiss, or Tim, or T-Pain, or Lil Jon, or Primo, nobody had to necessarily take that time out to perform and entertain for, for us. So right. I got to give that credit because, you know, everybody gets paid for what they do and, you know, Everybody could be doing something else. Correct. So, so I got to give them that credit. Um, and then on another level, if you're going to put yourself on a platform where I don't think anybody, any of them, 
has ever performed in front of a half a million people before. I don't think, you know, there's no stadium that holds a half a million unless you're no. Michael Jackson and you're on simulcast on Live Aid or something crazy like that. That's not happening. So I think the job should be to research as many things possible before you, you have a good two, three weeks for, before your battle. Research whatever the technology is. Most of these guys get the technology for free. Research that. So when you're in front of a half a million people, you're at your best. Um, and I think that um, Babyface did his research. And also Babyface did something also very important. We're out here telling people to wash their hands and social distance and all this kind of stuff. And I think Babyface embodied everything that we've been trying to tell people to do. And he embodied his level of professionalism, right? So that's Babyface for Babyface in this corner. Then you have Teddy Riley. I think Teddy is a natural showman. If he wasn't a natural showman, you wouldn't see him on tour every other day doing Teddy Riley and friends and really doing his thing. So Teddy comes from, and, and, and Face is a showman too, but Teddy comes from that, I'm going to put, I'm, if I'm going to be in front of y'all, I'm going to put on the best show I possibly can. So we had the drums and he had the lights and the TV screen and and the backup dancer and the television crew and the blah, blah, blah. And it gave a lesson in less is more. You understand? And I think that he understood that after a while. And I think that um, the people, on the other hand, took it to a whole nother level with the memes. And, right. and it's like, here you have somebody donating their time and energy, not social distancing, so he's risking his health right. and the health of everybody around him to give us a good show. And he is now penalized for it. But there's three sides to every story. Yeah. At the same time. Like I said, you got to know the arena that you're in. You're not on a stage in Vegas. You know what I'm right. saying? You're on a phone. People want to see people want to see us the way we're talking now. They want to see us in our real element. Right. They want to see us in a studio with our phone. And the music clear. There was enough beat battles to to see and do the research to know that this is what the people want. So, you know, it's like it's like um, what was the last fight when Homeboy came out in the full? Oh, Deontay Wilder. He came out in a Power Ranger suit, <laughs> and you understand why he got his ass beat. Like, yo, man, less is more. Just do what you got to do. And do it right, Just, you know. And then I want to add to that is uh, Babyface is real patient. Oh, <laughs> I was surprised. That shit was the most funniest. That was like a sitcom. I was like, I was, felt like I was watching, um, uh, 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 I don't know, um, The Odd Couple or something like that, like a, a yeah. new version. <laughs> Have you ever sipping his wine? He was Yo. just like, yeah, okay. Nothing funny in that. Nothing funny. And and this is what I don't want to happen. Where? You know, we as a collective, as a collective mass, we take the last thing we see and the last thing we experience and we super run with it. So right. I don't want people to now, when they think of Teddy Riley, you know, I've seen it before. It's like I did a live stream and my, my, my stream was acting crazy. So everybody was like, oh, there goes that Teddy Riley. He got that Teddy Riley phone. He's using that Teddy Riley sound. It's like, so now yeah. you are, are, you are, 
equating a man with great accomplishments with something that's janky and broke down now that that's his you know that and he had no control over it really yeah that's what a, that's what a million people saw and now he's the brunt of that joke and we don't we should not be able to tear down our heroes in a way that we just walk away with somebody as a a, a meme or a joke without acknowledging the greatness that they that they had um you know they had in front of them so you know as long as people stay with the respect level of these artists and these people then that's dope yeah because and, and what 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 some people don't realize is when you do that because i heard dr dre talking to him and dre was like man i don't i don't know if i'm ready to do that because it ain't right yeah you know what i mean because then you'll you'll kind of deter some really great artists were saying, I don't want I don't want that same thing to happen to me, so I'm not even gonna fuck with it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Where I think we should just appreciate it for what it is. Um yeah. and then the other thing, when you said half a million people were watching, what people don't realize, whatever that number you see that's live, times it times ten. Yeah. So actually five you know, five million people actually saw it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Even if they weren't all at the same time. Just like uh when I saw you know, RZA and, and Premier, you know, I think at, at the height it was like 180 something thousand. I'm yeah. like, there's damn near a million people that's seeing this shit. Yeah. This, shit is, this shit is wild. Yeah, and it's know? crazy because I'm trying to understand that even when, when I do my live streams, like I'll see it, it'll be, you know, anywhere from the hundreds to the thousands or whatever it is. But then when I log out after the stream, it'll be like 5,000 people watched or 10,000 people. But I don't see that. At the top of my well, that's why I said you, you basically have the times and times ten. So if you have if you have four thousand people viewing when it's over, if it's, if it averages that, because I think the 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 when we did it the very first time when I did yep. it with you, I think I saw at the height of it maybe it was at over four thousand something, mm -hmm. and then it was cutting off, and I was just saying, man, the fact that we had to restart, I know that it was a climb, but it kind of averaged between four and twenty five. So it's just roughly, you know, you had three thousand, so you had over forty thousand people that was checking it. Yeah, yeah, out. yeah, yeah. So, you know, it was it was, a, it was a beautiful thing. Yeah, and and what I also like is the way that you quickly evolved to it, right? You said you saw the DJ thing, and then I talked to you, and you was like, "Yo, you know what I think I want to do?" And then you set that shit up, and it looked it looked it looked great. Thank you. You know what I'm saying? So let's um. Let's take it back to the, to the top. Yeah. Right? Um, the first album, was it Boy Genius? Yes. 1989. Yep. Right? And then, did you release your next album the very next year? Yes. Yep. 1990. Yep. Only, only You. Yep. Double Platinum. Yep. And then we hit this tour. Well, we were on the tour, what, was it 1990? I don't think, I think we were on that tour in... We were on that tour well, so before you, my second album. Right, but okay, so okay, so you so we did two tours, right? Because you did that and yeah. then because I know only you was out on one of those tours we did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Um and you also you toured with uh you said you did some shows with NWA, right? Yes. So and my first shows. my first tour was the NWA Easy E tour. And it's so funny because I look back on it, these all these tours blend together. But the NWA Easy E tour, I think it was JJ Fad, DOC, NWA, Easy E, myself, Kid and Play. I thought y'all was on it, but no, y'all were on. Nah, we wasn't on it because we we didn't we didn't do our first US tour until nineteen ninety. Yeah, so in eighty nine that was that tour. And then it turned into another tour with Hammer, Salt and Pepper, Kid and Play, myself, and I want to say maybe that tour. And like all these tours blended in together. And then there was one with Tony, Tony, Tone, Guy, myself. Mm -hmm. And I think Salt and Pepper, and then you. Then I think when y'all came through, it was 
think Cube was on the tour because Cube started having his own stuff. Yeah, Cube, Cube did some shows with Public Enemy. Um, were you on the Public Enemy ones? Yeah, that, that was it. Because I was trying to think, was it the Big Bang King or the Public Enemy tour that we yeah. first toured together? Too Short. Um, and in me and y'all. Yeah. And, and you remember, um, what was the group out of Miami? They had B stands for... Po- I think it was Poison. Poison Posse. No, nah, no, nah, it wasn't Poison Clan. God damn it, they my homies too. They gonna kill me. Um, Young and the Restless. Yes, yes, Young and the Restless. Yes. Yeah. Yes. They came on, and I, and I just remember, I remember that tour because I, when they came on the tour, they were out of Miami, Liberty City, or whatever. And yep. when I first heard them talk, it felt, it sounded like they were speaking a different language. I couldn't, under, I couldn't decipher what the fuck they was talking about. <laughs> Yo, same thing with like Luke. Luke had these, you know, you know how he had his dances, right? And right. This is one dance I wanted to check for so much, man. I, I I know she was checking for me, and I remember trying to talk to her, and she was talking to me, and I was like, "What is she saying? I can't even figure none of this." You know, especially being from a New, uh, being a New York kid, and she was like pure Miami slang, and I was like, "I can't understand none of this." So it was, right. but that was the dope thing. That was a dope thing about. Um, being on tour with so many different people, we got to find yeah. out all the vibes from everybody. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. I never knew anybody that lived in California before that. You know, so me, yeah. you know, even though I know you're originally from Philly, but you, you're you out there, Shock's out there, Pac, all these different people that I was vibing with, um, you know, it was like a new experience. You know, and then to the point where I actually after one of those tours, moved out here and it was like me rolling with like DOC and all these other cats and it was like it's it's dope just to you know, just experience those different experiences, man. That, that's like the best thing that came out of doing this hip-hop. Yeah, let's, let's talk about that because <clears throat> from what I remember, it's almost like we just instantly fell in with each other, you know yep. what I mean? Yep. Like it was, the vibe was cool but, but I, but what I always tell people is that when we were on those tours back in the day, hip hop wasn't uh, it wasn't as big as it was. So the community was still kind of close knit, and yeah. it wasn't enough of it for it to branch off into these different hip hop genres and say we only do this kind or we only do this kind. We yeah. were kind of rolling, and then I also remember Chuck D kind of gathered us to say, "Look, we out here on the road. We got to take care of each other. We got to look out for each other." And we would eat. Our meals in the cafeteria together at yep. the same table. Yep. I'm sitting down next to you, Flavor Flav is sitting over there. Yep. And um, you know, Kid is over there and Ice Cube is over here. You know, we're all just eating and chopping it up. Yo, Flavor used to have a gang of kids on the road. Right. And any one of us would be Flavor's kids babysitter. I know I remember he had this one son, we used to call him Man Man. And um, I don't know how many times I used to babysit little man man while Chuck D and them were on on the road, and and it was a funny game that they used to play. If you weren't at the bus by six o'clock in the morning when the bus took off, you get left. So there's been so many times where a member of Public Enemy was on my bus going to the next city. Like Chuck even got left one time. You know, Flame got left no. one time. So, so you know, it was a very a familiar unit, you know what I'm saying? And I thought that was just real dope. Yeah. Um, and then talk about, um, you know, because that, that was one of the first tours that we brought Tupac on as well. Yeah. You know, when we started doing U.S. tours. And then talk about, you know, your first thoughts of Pac or what you remember most about being on tour. Because Pac was real tight with one of your dancers, Peekaboo. Yeah. He used to... Wild out together. Yeah, Pac. So, two things. You know, a couple of things I remember about Pac. Pac was that, and I'm pretty sure I know that you have the same perspective, deeper than mine, of course, but, like, the image that everybody has of Pac is dope. You know what I'm saying? It's dope that he's such an iconic figure. 
But my image in my mind, my personal image was just like this kid full of life, full of energy, full of jokes, you know, um, not going to blow up names or anything, but he was in a relationship with somebody on the road and I was right. in a relationship with somebody on the road. So we would sit, you know, like literally me and him would just sit for hours. He'd be like, man, my girl getting on my nerve. And we would just go back and forth with how do we deal with having girlfriends on the road? You know what I'm saying? That was me and Pac's relationship. Or or he would go to my girl and he would have, you know, those question and answer things. Or we would double up and we would just talk and hang out and just be on some teenage couple shit. You know, for real. Like, you know, we were kids. Um, right, exactly. You know, so, so you know, that's that's my image of 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 pop you know um and and then at the same time we would be going through these cities where we couldn't curse on stage we couldn't have any kind of sexual overtones or anything on stage so we would have to watch each other back and there's a lot of times you know I just remember some, one thing, and, and I remember talking to you about it, and I got it mixed up with the NWA talk because we used to go through that a lot. But yeah, there, was, that. there was this one incident. I don't know what Pac and Peekaboo did. I don't remember the city. I don't remember the incident. But I remember me, a couple other cats had to go to the jail and get them out. <laughs> That's all I remember. And and I just remember just being on some because me and and and, and my dancer Peekaboo we got into it after that because I thought it was like um, I just was super embarrassed about it. I was like, man, I got to go down there, bail these kids out of jail. You know, like if I was day pops or something like that. I don't know what them. You ready to send? You ready to send Peekaboo home? We did. We sent him home. <laughs> We definitely send them he, was a wild, he was a wild dude. I mean, just just for the people that, that are checking this out, Kwame's dancer was was wild like Tupac. I mean, it was crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and they used to wild out. You know what I'm saying? Them two, yeah. when them two went off together, I'm like, oh my God, something about to happen, man. And, 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 and it was just, but it was like, you know, other people look at it as, oh, artists, classic artists, iconic artists on a tour. But for us, it was like summer camp. You know what I'm saying? We, yeah, were, we were kids going around the country on a bus doing the things we right. love. But at the end of the day, we were kids for the most part. I don't remember y'all having any grown-up chaperones Making a, making y'all do be in the room at a certain time, or I didn't have none. You know, I'm I'm at that time 1990. What I'm 17, 18. So right. so you know, it was that it was that experience. Um, that was so that was so dope. And then I just remember another experience. Shock's brother. For some reason, we would always, you know how we would all go, like, take whatever hotel we stay in, we'd all be get on our bus or get a runner and go to the venue. And mind you, we were playing stadiums. We weren't playing, like, clubs or nothing like that. So it was like a stadium every night or, you know, an arena oh, yes. every night. But Shots, brother, no matter what city, we would always see him. As we're driving to the arena, we would always see him walking. Like, he would, like... Right. We would always see him walking and playing the guitar. I'm like, yo, what's up? Why don't he yeah. never get on the band? But you know, that was always something that always stuck in my mind that we would always, always, always check that out. But it was a fun time, man. Well, what one 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 incident I, I remember, and then tell me if you remember this, because I'll always remember this. I think we were in Milwaukee, right? Oh. And then if you bring that and, and let me see if you know if it's the same thing. Yeah, well, uh, this is what I remember, and then you tell me the story. What I remember is we're in this hotel in Milwaukee, and these cats, that's, you know, they, I guess they came. We were staying there a few days. So either they came after the show or they 
found out we were at that hotel hanging out. Yep. And they were trying to talk to Tasha, I believe. Yep. And and one of them disrespected her or something like that. Yeah. And it kind of escalated. And then you, you know, you weren't about that bullshit. You feel me? <laughs> you weren't playing no games. And I just remember that when the word got around that you had some, some beef or some funk, we were all with it and, and, and ready to get down with whatever was going to happen. Yeah, yeah. And that's why, that's why I bring up, um, um, what's the name? You know, from Miami. I can't remember. Uh, Younger Restless. Yeah, Younger and Restless. Because I remember ch- I was chilling with them. I think we were in a room freestyling, me, them, and Pac or whatever. Yeah. And we just heard about it or something was in the hallway. And we come out. And I think you, did you, you, you slid the dude, didn't you? Yeah. yeah, that's what I'm saying. I like, well, there ain't no punk. You'll knock your ass out. <laughs> Yo, so, so, so let me tell you what happened. Please. So basically, we're all, we're all on the same floor. Right? right. That's what I remember. And and my room was, say, my room was here. Tasha's room was next to mine, connecting room. And there was another connecting room to either my DJ Tat or my boy Al. So Al was in one room. Al and Tap was in one room. I'm in the middle. Tasha's here. So we all had to, this is after the show, and we all had to bounce that next morning. So we go to wherever we were going to the next next spot. Right. So um, for some reason, all of our doors were open. We were just in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. It was the middle of the night. And I remember packing my bags and my back was to the door and some dude i turned around and there was some dude in my room so i'm like yo uh, he said yo i thought this was the party was up in here the party up in here but like, ain't no party in here get the fuck out of my room so he leaves the room right. and apparently goes into tasha's room uh, but tasha was in my room she came to my room and when he went into her room he stole, she had this Louis Vuitton bag. Oh. And she, he stole the bag. So, we didn't know the bag was stolen because she was going back and forth between my room and Al's room back and forth, back and forth. And, and, um, he came back in the room. I was in Al's room. And as I walked back into my room, he was standing in my room again. So, I'm like, yo, man. She's about to get real nasty. We can we can do it calm. We can do it gritty. But you know this guy this guy this, this ain't ain't nothing happening in this room. So he leaves. Right. So then I get a um, a phone call from the manager downstairs, and they were like, um, "Is there Tasha Lambert in your party?" And I'm like, "Yeah, but we have her um, her ID. We have a wallet." And an ID downstairs So we're like what So that's how we found out The bag was stolen Because all this stuff Was in the bag So they dumped everything Out in the parking lot And stole the bag Okay So we go downstairs And I'm like Yo I bet it's that dude That was coming in And out of the room I'm, I'm willing to bet So We knew that We saw the guy In and out of the hall So we figured That they were in the room in a room on the hallway too. So me, Al, Tad, a couple of us start knocking on everybody's door. Boom, 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 boom. So he opens the door. We finally find him. He opens the door. So I'm like, look, man, I know you got the bag. Give up the bag. Or oh, shit's about to get nasty in here. So so yeah, I ain't got no bag. I ain't got no bag. So I walk I, we walk in the room. Mind you, it's just him, and you don't see anybody else as a sweep. This wig is super funny, I guarantee you. I walk in the room, I look, and I see her bag hanging on the doorknob. No way. So I'm like, oh, so you don't have a bag, right? So this is, this is what we're doing? And he said something. I knocked him. Boop. And then all you hear, and that's when y'all didn't come yet. Right, I know we just heard about it. All you hear is some commotion in the back of the room. Right. And here comes these dudes. I swear to you, man. 
All I can remember, they were in their underwear. <laughs> had on Speedos, cowboy boots, and hats. Nothing else. Speedos. And they came out the back room, like four or five of them. And some of them had techs. Some had nine. I was like, what type of shit is going on in here? And then... Hey, wait, let me just remember. I, I remember a few Jerry Curls, too. Jerry Curl, everything. It was crazy. Yo, these dudes look yeah. crazy. But at the same time as these guys were running out, y'all ran up. Right. And then it just de-escalated. But you know what I'm saying? Everybody ran up. They ran out. And all I was, I was remember being in the front of the pack and watching these right. half-naked dudes come out of the room with guns. And I'm just like, there's no way these niggas in speedos and cowboy boots is gonna kill me. This I cannot go out like that. There's just no way on the planet. That, and cowboy hats and Jerry curls, that that can't happen, man. That just that is not gonna happen in my lifetime. And then it just it just you know we got the bag. Everybody was on the hallway yucking it up, and then we got all you know we all got on our bus and went to the next the next place. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you. I'm glad you told that story because I I just remember vaguely that I just remember I was like, yeah, I remember. Well, I may knock these niggas out in Milwaukee. We's ready to get down. Oh no, yeah, that dude, know that dude that kept coming in and out of my room. He said, I, I said, man, you got one more thing to say, man. And it's you know I'm not you know I'm not trying to portray myself as 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 the Mike Tyson of rap or anything like that. But come on, man, you violate. You're not vi you're not just violating my room. You violate my people's room. And then you're going to lie about it when I'm looking right at the bag. Oh, I don't know how they got this, man. You know what? Okay. I don't know how this fist got on your neck. How about that? So, you know. Right. And people don't realize, man, like you said, when we were kids, but we was out there, we had to take care of ourselves. Each yeah. city posed those types of threats. Yes. You understand what I'm saying? You know, so and I, you I, I have move. known, and, and I think, I think this story got a got off very lightly because I know other music cats who went into Milwaukee and never came home. You know what I'm saying? Oh, Milwaukee is grimy. Shout out to Scott Knox, DJ Newstyles. One of our DJs from Milwaukee. Yeah. So yeah Milwaukee, a Milwaukee's not a joke. And I think, you know, you know, I don't know if I could have done things a different way, maybe not have my door open. But but other than that, you know, it was handled the way it was handled, but it was it's a great story. Yeah, and I, you know I just remember it as good times. Yeah, yep. Because <laughs> it because it worked out right. Yep, yep. Because also I also remember one time on that tour that one of the promoters didn't want to pay the tour, and it was an issue with Chuck, and then our our security had to go in there with the guns out, mm -hmm. and, and it got a little hectic. And and you know I was the type of guy, even back then I was always interested in the behind the scenes stuff. So yeah. even when they would go collect, you know, the balance of the money, I would always ask our manager, our role manager, like, let me go with you so I can see it, right? Yeah, yeah. And it just so happened is one day I went with him and shit got a little funky. And I was yeah, oh like, no, wow. the countless janky promoter stories, man, this stuff that I just can't even admit to. How <laughs> we had to, we had to get we had to get our promote our promoters to pay up. So you know, yeah, and and people don't realize to this right day, promoters get on some stupidness, man. It's like to this very day. Trust me. Oh man, I know it. Yeah. So you know, let's kind of fast forward a little bit because I mean, you had you had a would you say from like '89 the run with with the whole Kwame in the New Beginning? Mm -hmm. It was three albums. Yeah. Well, four. So a good yes. four. A good four year run, right? Yeah. But then you kind of you reinvented yourself, and I don't think a lot of people, you know, probably not a lot of, of my audience know that, you know, your second, I call it second career, mm -hmm. or you, you know, as a producer, like trumps that by ten million, right? Yeah. Well, because yeah. you. Yeah. And yeah. so, what, what was it? Like, tell me how that that went about. Because all right, the the third album didn't do what you wanted it to do. Maybe the label dropped, or maybe you got off the label. What made you say, you know what? 
fuck it, I just want to produce. And well, how did you get back into it? So, so basically, the third album, two things happened with the third album. If the third album would have, I'm constantly in the studio. So when right. album one is out, I'm recording album two. When album two is out, I'm recording album three. And I think by the time the third album was done, mm -hmm. there was a lot of executive shifts up at Atlantic Records. And so okay. that put a lot of things on pause. So by the time third album comes out, rap has changed. You know, okay. that fast, up-tempo, you know, heavy sample, doing a running man type rap was gone. And we have now like Tribe Called Quest and, and that those the grimy 90s start coming in. And so that album kind of, when you when it came out, it just sounded, and that's the album called Nasty. It sounded just overproduced and and not of not in the in the ether of what rap was doing at the time, and so I think um, I fell into that crack. But what it was, I was, I was never dropped, but they gave me an option because rap started becoming so so hardcore at this point, right. and so cookie cutter. You know what I'm saying? New York cats were sounding like New York cats. West Coast cats were sounding like West Coast. Everything started getting put in that box around yeah, 92. Started, started, started. You know what I'm saying? 91, 92. So they were like, I always wrote and produced my own stuff. So the label started suggesting whoever was popular at the time to start writing and producing records for me. And they were like, you know, take off the suits, chill with them polka dots. You need to wear like, you know, like dress like Tretch or or, or <laughs> dress like Snoop. You know, braid your hair up, man. You know, you got the flat top with the blind. You know, you should put it in some braids. You know, here, here you take, put on some Tims, you know, use the, have a baseball Bullshit. bat. And I'm like, right. Imagine me being that guy. That would be I've seen, worse. I've seen some people try it. That would be worse than putting out a bad record. You know what right. I'm saying? Like plaques in my hair. I would have, yo, man. Imagine Kwame looking like O Dog. It was just never, ever going to happen. And I was right. like, I'd rather. Leave this establishment <laughs> that you have here. Yeah, like Jim Brown says in the Bruce Lee movie, I would like to leave your I like to leave your island. island. Yeah, <laughs> I like to leave your island. Um, I'd rather leave this island than to be subject to this. So I bounced. My problem was I thought that because of my past success, that it would be very easy to get another deal, and it uh. wasn't. You know, you know, the other labels that were offering deals were offering the same thing. Yes, if you toughen up, um well, you know, if you get rid of if you get rid of everything who we know you to be, we may consider it. Yeah. Can't do it. So then I signed for the fourth album, I signed with this independent label who only person on that label at the time was MC Breed. So he had the record with Pop, gotta get mine. Oh, get yours. And um, so, and, and ain't no future in your front end. So we we saw that that um, uh, there was some success at that label. And so we decided to do this. And I went to that label, and which was a great experience. The, the, the label sucked. The album didn't do shit, but it was the best Ichabon experience. Like yes, Ichabon Records. Um, right. The best experience that I've had as an artist, and I'm going to tell you why. One, I recorded the whole album in my bedroom on a four-track tape machine. And then I went to, and th th they were located in Atlanta. So I went out to Atlanta. I got to live the early hip-hop Atlanta life um, yeah. while I was out there. So... That was another experience for me that I would have never had 
sitting up in New York. Um, I transferred everything that I did on the four track and, you know, I did it in a regular 24 track studio, but the owner of the label was like, I'm not paying for none of your samples. You have to do a whole non sample album. So that was something that I never did before. I, I always had live instruments and, and, and incorporated instrumentation in my samples, but I never mm -hmm. did a zero sample album. Um, so that was a challenge. That challenge was more important to me than the record. I was like, oh, word, you're going to have me do a non-sample album? I mean, I was going to jazz clubs. I was pulling out in, uh, 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 different instrumentalists and bringing them in the studio, going to different clubs, meeting chicks. Hey, you want to be on a song? I need the girls to talk. I need a girl singer. I need a this. I need a that. Pulling people, boom, 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 and putting them in the studio and creating from scratch or recreating things that I, that I, um, that I did back in New York in the bedroom. And that experience was so dope to me. You know what I'm saying? The, the studio was in uh, Kennesaw, Georgia. <clears throat> there were no black people at the time. There's a bunch of black people in Kennesaw now, but there were no black people in 1992 in Georgia. This is pre-Olympics Georgia. So anybody that knows Georgia like that, this pre-Olympics, Atlanta, right. post-Olympics, Atlanta. We are living in the post-Olympics, 96 Olympics, Atlanta. So okay. um, so I'm in Kennesaw, Georgia. They hated the fact that this rap music was being played in the studio. Other businesses were telling them to turn that shit off, get these right. niggas out of here. You know, we were, we were dealing with some down south stuff. Um, and, and the dopest thing for us was this brand new restaurant called Hooters. <laughs> and we would go to Hooters and we would look at the, the, the waitresses and we'd bag them and we'd bring them to the, whole, to, the, um, to the studio and we'd have them, you know, saying stuff on records. It was like, you know, we were young. What was it? I was 22, maybe, 21, 22. So I was still having a good time, even though my conditions were terrible, you know, like right. financially, uh, musically, it was just under bad conditions, but you know, I still made the best of it. And and um, during that time, the crazy thing about Ichabon was they put the record out and never told me. So I'm in New York, I'm in Tower Records. I'm looking for, I'm digging, like looking for records to sample and stuff like that, and yeah. literally see my record on the shelf. Wow. I'm like, well, wait, wait, what? <laughs> You know, the record was poorly mastered, poorly mixed, but if I had to pick some of my favorite records that I've ever done as an artist, they're on that album. You know, to be honest with yeah. you, that was a raw, raw album. It was called Incognito, and it exactly, the title was it fitting, because it was, it was there, but nobody saw it. But, so, so, after, so from that experience, you felt like, well, you know, is that what, what kind of empowered you to say, like, I can do this producing thing because, you know, I want to run down and help me out um, so that people can get an idea. Like, you produced on Lloyd Banks on Fire. You did that track, right? Yes. Um, you produced for LL, Christina Aguilera, uh, Mary J. Blige. Um, just give, 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 give so, so, so the thing you know. is this, you know, I was always a producer. You know, when I started, um, when I started as a younger kid, I used to be up under Herbie Lovebug and, right. uh, you know, would go through like production ideas with him. I never like fully on produced any records for him. Um, but the first record that I produced under, I'm never giving you the name of this record because this record sucks, but I produced a record for one of his artists and I don't want nobody looking for it. I really don't like this record. But it was the first record. They spelled my name wrong and everything. And, you know, and then I, you know, I was always producing my stuff. So being a producer was something that I always wanted to do. You know, my icons, you know, Herbie was an icon for me. Prince was an icon for me. Stevie Wonder was an icon. So all the people that I looked up to produced other people or at least had other acts that they had out. So my goal was always to be a producer. So when, the rap stuff 
wasn't working at the time. I was just like, you know, um, there's always going to be a new artist and they're always going to need music. So before I got to the LLs and all those people, yo, man, I hit the streets. Like any, any rapper with some money that needed some beats, hit, get at me. I had a little, uh, did uh, any of those underground when you were starting out, did any of them kind of bubble at all? You, no, you no, no, no. It was just, you know, <laughs> it was just the time where everybody wanted to be, you know, like I, I give it like they, everybody wanted to be state property or somebody like that. And every, everybody oh. that was making street money turned into a rap label or whatever, you know, during this early, late nineties, early two thousands period, mid to late nineties. Yeah period and everybody was just doing that and and um you know that was my hustle you know it, it could have been i could have been doing something else you know i could have i could have been like you know and there's nothing wrong with it i could have went back to school i could have went and got a job i could have done whatever i needed to do to survive but i knew that what i wanted to do was music and and in doing so, uh, you know, it tur one thing turned into another. So a good friend of mine, his name was Ron Amin Ra Lawrence, and he was a part of the Hitmen, Puffy, uh, okay. you know, Bad Boy. And he did, you know, uh, Biggie's Hypnotize. He did Money, Power, Respect. You know, he did a lot of big records for them. But he was also somebody that grew up with me. And he was like, yo, Pong. Um, I was playing him records and, and beats and stuff, and he was like, yo, man, you got so many beats, man. Your name is trash in the industry, but maybe if you just come up with another name or something, we can sell these beats. So we were joking around. I was like, yeah, I got a million beats. I'm like, Terminator, just call me K1 million. And, and so he was like, oh, I'm going to run with that. And so Ron... Ron started playing these beats because Ron was super hot. Ron started playing these beats for people. And then he just called me out of the blue. He was like, yo, man, you back. I'm like, what you mean? He's like, yo, man, we just landed three songs for LL and one song for Mary J. Blige. I was like, what? what? And Burn. at the same time, I produced a record for um, this movie on HBO called Dancing in September. But the records that I produced, I was the artist. So I was making, you know, still making records. And I got them landed on this HBO film, which ended right. up getting nominated for Emmy. So all these things started coming back at the same time. And okay. um, after the, um, you know, and then by being in the studio with Mary, being in the studio with LL, you know, A&Rs were coming in, different people. So the word started getting out that Quam, you know, he's doing his his thing again he, on, on, on the production side. And, you know, my job was always, my job as a producer, I don't think there's a, a, a time limit on a, a good producer. And, and my goal no. is to always be known or, or understood as a, a well-rounded, good producer, great producer if possible. Um, and I never wanted to just be a hip hop producer or R&B producer, or a pop producer. So my job was to find a way to get in every crack and crevice in the industry and rock with somebody. So, so you know, I don't, you know, I'm not trying to be a resume dude, but it's like from LL to Mary J. Blige, from Mary J. Blige to somebody like a Christina Aguilera. Um, from Christina Aguilera to a, a Keisha Cole, from Keisha Cole to a Fantasia, Fantasia to Drew Hill, Drew Hill to Dipset to 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 Lloyd Banks to, to you know working you know working with people like Jay Z or whatever, and you know some well, of these records never came out, but it's still building with so many people, you know, um, doing film scores, you know, as of now I have like. 12 so like step up step up to stop the yard freedom riders um uh uh fantastic four you know doing the, the film stuff um you know even now um i have my own label under universal music group and and i have the rb artist 
Vivian Green. So we've been putting out records just on that on oh, that um, adult R and B vibe, and and those records have been doing well. So it's it's about maneuvering in all aspects of music. Because I want people to understand the thing about me is I love this music, and and I never want to make it about me. I want to make it about the music, and I want to be able to to rock with as many artists as possible and make as much music as possible until I just, until I check out, until I just can't do it anymore. So, um, you know, that's always been the goal as a producer. And even more so now as a producer, producing musical events like, like the Breakfast Joint. You know what I'm saying? That's right. me being a producer and just trying to put on a, a, a real dope event. So, you know. And then, you know, I have also have an artist named Bobby J from Rockaway, another independent artist out of New York. And, and, and he gives us that great, um, great boom bap type hip hop. And, and you, know, you know, I'm glad to contribute to that. It's, it's just trying to move it, maneuver as many places as possible. Yeah, you, and you downplayed it, but man, you did your thing with Vivian Green. To, Thank to you. Actually, not to be your artist and try to do so well. You got the Will Smith joint. Yeah, um, Will Smith Smith Smith. Smith. What's the name of that tweet record? Tweet, turn off the lights. Turn the lights off. Turn, turn off, off the, the lights. Light. And look, you know, let me tell you um, something about the Will Smith record. And you know, I, sure. and, I, and I try to tell this story, especially to people who are trying to be up and coming writers and producers and artists. And, and, and the moral of the story is go with your gut. So I, I was in the middle of signing this big, publishing deal with Universal, sure. which I don't suggest anybody ever do in their life, but that's a whole other story. Um, I'm signing this big deal, a lot of money involved with this deal, and then I get the Will Smith record. Hold on, let me stop you, Quam. You know, they give you an hour, they're about to cut me off, I'm going to click back on, jump back on, Okay. because I want to hear the story, and then I want to play a little game we do with you as well. Okay, bet. So I'm going to click off and just everybody jump right back on. All right. I'm, I'm a, all right. 